There we go. Hello and thank you very much. I apologize, I do not speak Hebrew. I humbly apologize for that. Um, I'm delighted to be here on behalf of uh, the, the several NGOs who invited me to take a thorough look at the Leviathan documents and just offer my respectful uh, concerns and recommendations. What the people of, this is a decision for the people of Israel, and um, all, I'm just simply offering my concerns and critiques and suggestions respectfully, and it, it's entirely up to the people and the government here as to what you find appropriate and what and what, want to incorporate and what you do not. I was a professor with the University of Alaska for 30 years. I first started in the Arctic um, in 1980 and, and where I was teaching uh, around the coastal communities of Alaska, offshore oil drilling, uh, concerns and marine issues. Then I was in Prince William Sound both before and during the Exxon Valdez oil spill which was uh, uh, an overnight disaster in many of our lives. I'll discuss some of that, and then I was in Anchorage. And uh, since 2010, I retired from the university and I've gone to full-time consulting. I've worked around the world on these issues, both from spill prevention standpoint, spill response, damage assessment, and environmental restoration after oil spills. I've written manuals for the United Nations and such. One thing I've learned going around the world is that often I'm asked to come in after a disaster has happened, and by then it's usually too late to do much to affect a situation effectively. Uh, I'm, that, that, for that reason, I really commend the NGOs and the public here in Israel for getting ahead of this issue and having this conversation today and for the past year before you have had a disaster. <clears throat> I, cert I think that is remarkable, the level of attention and engagement for the public here in this issue. Before, why you can be effective is truly a testament to, to uh, some commitment here in Israel. So thank you. Um, I'll go through this fairly quickly, and then I'm going to, I, I was asked to divide my discussion into two sections. This morning will be the risks, uh, sort of what can happen when things fall apart and go wrong. And then this afternoon will be my suggestions as to how to reduce those risks in Leviathan. Um, again, my, uh, my contacts here are Guardians, Guardians of the Coastal Plain, Homeland Guards, and Zalul. I reviewed thousands of pages of Leviathan documents, produced an independent opinion uh, that should be in circulation now. Uh, none of these groups exerted any editorial control uh, over that opinion. It was completely independent. You've all seen these, this map, I'm sure. Um, it's a little difficult to see, I apologize for that, but a, an estimate of, of probably 22 trillion cubic feet of gas, 40 million barrels of condensate, and per, several hundred million barrels, perhaps, of oil at the bottom of the reservoir. Um, there is promise. I mean, there are upsides, certainly, to these developments. Uh, jobs, energy, enormous economic activity that, will, that can ensue from, from uh, petroleum development and a lot of government revenue. But what I've found around the world almost habitually is that industry and government commit a few uh, routine mistakes in these things. They generally understate the risks and impacts, overstate the, benef the potential benefits, and overstate their response capability to an accident. And I have seen this everywhere. It is true in the United States. It is true in Norway, uh, the UK, uh, Africa. And I've worked in all of these places on this issue. And it just seems to be in the DNA of government to, and, and industry. And it's in their interest. I, I can understand where this comes from, but it is not always in the public interest to be somewhat disingenuous or incorrect about this. Um, Operational impacts from these, you, you all know them. Uh, there will be undersea noise, sea bat, habitat damage. Uh, there will be marine and atmospheric discharge and visual and aesthetic impacts from the shore. These are unavoidable. There will be, they will exist, they will occur. Uh, they can be mitigated and I'm not confident that, the that they've been mitigated sufficiently. But my biggest concern about this, well, the these uh, impacts will occur in construction, drilling, 
And both construction pipeline laying and drilling ha are already underway, as you know, and then production for 30 years. So these need to be thought about very methodically and carefully. I'm uncomfortable having looked through all the documents that all the risk and impacts have been mitigated sufficiently at this point. Uh, my biggest concern is the risk of catastrophic accidents, just because that's, what, that's most of my experience around the world, either from natural gas or condensate release. Um, the condensate spill models that have been done for Leviathan range from, uh, and interesting, th this, this number was redacted, as Professor Wolf's son was showing, was redacted from the documents, but it was still retrievable. The, the drilling, these models project at a worst case discharge of 175,000 barrels of condensate would be released from drilling, about 1,000 from the pipeline, about 1,000 from uh, the platform. Regardless, I don't consider any of those worst case discharge scenarios. We've got a lot of experience with uh, predictions on worst case discharge and then the actual worst case discharges being many, many times larger than that. The first huge offshore uh, blowout was the Xtox spill in 1979, three million barrels that went on for nine months. The Montera disaster off of northeast, uh, Northwest Australia, which continued for 74 days, unplugged. And these are some pretty sophisticated industry and government oversight uh, outfits. And of course, the Deepwater Horizon, uh, immediately after I retired from the university, I went to work on this down in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010 it continued for almost three months before it was plugged. And again, this sort of thing was never supposed to be able to happen, yet it did. And it's not entirely unusual, it does happen. These are dangerous proje projects. Anybody that tells you differently is either being disingenuous or uh, doesn't know. Um, but, but these are dangerous projects. This stuff is volatile and explosive and it's toxic if it spills, both the methane and the condensate. Um, here's a good example of BP rig in the Gulf of Mexico before the Deepwater Horizon. They just simply plumbed a pipe wrong and it almost completely sank during a hurricane. Um, the, Sanchi, uh, the largest condensate spill in history occurred just this January in the East China Sea. A tanker carrying um, South Pars condensate from Iran was heading north to Korea and it collided with a freight vessel. And I was involved in advising the, Chinese, the government and, and others and NGOs on this issue. Uh, the tanker, this is the tanker, the Sanchi, it exploded, lost all crew, 32 uh, crewmen died. Uh, the tanker drifted for uh, about a week and then sank. Uh, the entire load of condensate went up and most of it was probably ignited and went off in an atmospheric plume. Um, some of it, uh, this is a, a photo sent to me confidentially by somebody on the scene, obviously. This is the tanker completely incinerated, and uh, this is on the port side of the vessel. The collision was on the starboard side, and you can see the explosive force. It was a double hull tanker, and it blew out the outside shell of the double hull. It was spilling out into the ocean. Um, the Deepwater Horizon, I'm going to go through these very quickly, but I think it's absolutely critical that if anything comes out of disasters like this, it's helping everyone else everywhere avoid this sort of thing. Let's learn the lessons of these things and prevent them as much as we can here in Israel. Yeah. And there had been tens of thousands of wells drilled in the Gulf of Mexico prior to Deepwater Horizon. Um, the, deep, the, the Deepwater Horizon is semi-submersible Mobile offshore drilling unit began drilling in February. Uh, the guys on the rig called it a nightmare well. They were having problem after problem after problem. And when you see this, just think about uh, the wells that are being drilled at Leviathan. There is nothing about this that could not happen at Leviathan. These are high pressure, deep water reservoirs. And even though the reservoirs are different, there's not much oil at the top of this reservoir, I understand. There's still a lot of gas and condensate, which is uh, extremely volatile. They, they call it the well from hell. This is while they were drilling it. I, I'm not going to go through much of this, but this is a list. There's two pages here, a list of the mistakes made that led up to the disaster. They were, they were in a hurry. It's a deep water reservoir. They were 40, 43 days behind schedule. There was company pressure to hurry up. Uh, the, well, the, the well design was incorrect. 
they didn't do this, the proper testing. Uh, they had all sorts of problems uh, with kicks coming up the well. The subsea uh, battery on the blowout preventer failed. The alarm systems failed. Uh, just problem after problem. This is just a, this is a schematic, by the way. You can get a sense of what, a, this is a blowout preventer on the wellhead, and the well, the drilling well, just sort of tapers all the way down to the reservoir like this, uh, the semi-submersible or the drill ships here. This is very similar to what Leviathan is doing. Um, the blow-up preventer is an enormous piece of equipment, 300 to 400 tons that is placed on the wellhead. They're 20 meters high. It's a sophisticated uh, piece of uh, engineering, and there's a number of different ways they are supposed to seal a failed blow out, blowing out well. Uh, they can be operated by the rig, either electrically, acoustically, uh, hydraulically, or by the auto, uh, sort of the dead man switch and automatic mode function on the thing, or the a remotely operated vehicle. All of those failed in the Deepwater Horizon. Every single redundant system on the blowout preventer failed. Corporate negligence, human error, equipment malfunction, and ineffective government oversight in the United States. And we have been pushing this for years in the US, we're still not comfortable with government oversight. Uh, the subcontractors all had a, a, a role in this. They will, there will be a number of subcontractors out here that are involved. And the management of subcontractors and assignment of risks and liabilities is very, very important. They tried many different things to respond to the blowout, including uh, a, a containment dome that plugged with methane hydrates. They tried uh, a top kill where they were blowing uh, things including golf balls down through the top of the blowout preventer they just blew right back out then they put a containment stack on it and started collecting some of the oil to the sea surface and finally uh, the the final way to kill a, a blowout is through a relief well you do, here's the failed well they drill another relief well here intersect at the bottom and inject heavy muds and then cements and finally se uh, seal the well that way it took several months to do that in Deepwater Horizon. It's the largest spill response effort in history. 47,000 people, 7,000 vessels, $14 billion, yet only 3% of what actually spilled uh, without containment was recovered. Um, covered a large area, largest accidental spill in history. I'm just gonna blast through these very quickly just to give you a sense of what, when things go wrong, and there's a thousand and one different ways that these things can go wrong, how bad it can be. Uh, their oil spill response plan I was asked to review by a media outlet right after this, and they had walruses in there, and they're, you know, it's ridiculous. There's no walrus in the Gulf of Mexico. They just did a cut and paste from an Alaska oil spill plan and put it in, this is BP, and put it in their Gulf of Mexico oil spill plan. The equipment list, you link, you link to it and went to a Japanese home shopping network. It was absurd. Uh, they tried to burn some of it. They, they did burn some of it. This is a number one response tool here in Israel. They will use dispersants for a major spill. I do not think they will work on condensate. They don't work very well on crude oil. Uh, but it's basically a chemical surfactant that they try to spray on surface oil. I've been out on a number of these. The tests show that they really don't work. And it, it, so it's kind of a, it's pleasant for the media to be able to see that there's a response, but it really doesn't work and can actually cause more problems than it solves. Mechanical recovery, you see these are booms trying to collect oil. And you can see all the oil out here and what they're collecting in here. It just doesn't work. Uh, the booms do, you know, this is something that may be useful here. These are called sorbent booms. They're basically like a sponge. They absorb hydrocarbons in the water. That might be somewhat, you could at least try that if there's a major condensate spill here. Uh, the booms are hard to deploy. They sometimes use booms in the skimmer to suck things up at the apex of the booms. Um, the shoreline, even, even though the rig was, the well was 50 miles offshore, uh, of course, here's the oil coming ashore after a few weeks. And uh, again, this is oil, but much of, I've heard, we've brought the Deepwater Horizon up here to government and they say, well, that was oil. And the answer to that is, well, yes, it was oil, but it was also about 40% uh, natural gas. So it was a gas blowout first and foremost. That is what caused the pressure to blow out. That's what ignited the rig. That's what caused the problem. 
So there were, and the effects were dramatic, as one expects, with toxic contamination of, of a productive coastal and offshore ecosystem. There were large subsurface plumes of the methane that came out of the deep, deep water wellhead. And the other important thing is to remember that a release of condensate on the sea surface might evaporate very quickly, more quickly, but a release from deep water infrastructure like a wellhead or deep water pipelines like you would have here in Leviathan would travel up through the water column over 1,600 meters of water depth, so it would, it would, there would be more dissolution, more emulsification, and less evaporation at the sea surface. Uh, it affected even down to larval stages of uh, tuna, uh, and here's oil droplets in the plankton samples. So it affects the entire pelagic offshore ecosystem, regardless of what you do, including the deep water, the deep sea. Um, acute mortality of organisms, again, I'll just you get the drift here. The other important thing is there's chronic sublethal injuries, not just the animals that are killed immediately in these things, but organisms can absorb and be exposed to hydrocarbons, including condensate and methane, and exhibit sublethal respiratory, reproductive, behavioral uh, uh, injury too. And that's rather important and can have long-term effects in the system. Um, human health effects. This is just, a, I think, a protest here on the beach. Uh, but there are certain, you know, this is toxic stuff. You don't want to be around it. I've been around too much of it in my life. But uh, it can cause all sorts of epidemiological results in humans, uh, including mental health impacts with a major industrial disaster. This is very little appreciated, but with a major ecological disaster, there's a huge amount of social disruption and, uh, and harm caused. I mean, you can see these guys, they don't look too happy. They're not. Um, even though BP established a $20 billion victim's claim fund immediately, the money sometimes can be fuel on, on a fire. It, you know, people want it, but they, it doesn't solve problems. There's a number of memorable quotes here from BP during this. You can expect the same thing from the industry here if there's uh, a big disaster. Uh, another spill I worked on in that very same year, just to show you, tanks are not necessarily immune. Tank farms on shore. This is in Dalian, China. Uh, an explosion of a major 90,000 ton tank. It spilled uh, a lot of fuel out into the harbor. And the Chinese, more power to them. This is one of the more effective spill responses I ever saw. It was in a very contained inshore area. And they just went out with shovels and straw mats and got, it, got a lot of it back. Not, a, not all of it, but they, it was really a remarkable response. Exxon Valdez in Alaska something I, I worked on for many years. In 1971, when they wanted to build the pipeline across Alaska from the Arctic down to the down to tidewater and the and ice-free port in the south, they promised that not one drop of oil will ever spill into uh, coastal waters. Does that, does that sound familiar? Um, and we didn't believe it at the time. And we pushed for <coughs> additional safeguards, more stringent, uh, best available technology in the tankers and the vessel traffic system and the spill response capability. We'd, we didn't get it. 1989, Exxon Valdez, several hundred thousand barrels of oil spilled. 30 years later, now, we still have oil in our beach. We still have ecological injury from the event 30 years ago. So don't let anybody tell you, and this is crude oil, mind you, but Condensate and natural gas releases, large scale, can also cause significant e ecological harm. Uh, risk assessments of these low probability, high consequence events, I don't think we do a darn good job with, frankly. Um, and a great example is one of the most highly engineered systems we've ever constructed in the United States is the space shuttle program. The best engineers in the business, the most methodical oversight and review and, and risk assessment and everything took place. Then we had the Challenger disaster in 1986 from a very simple failure of a cold O-ring to the fuel tank. Catastrophic failure. Everybody dies. They had a number of uh, reviews after that. They fixed that problem and many other problems. What they didn't do, though, is anticipate the problem, a very simple problem. Another chunk came off the gantry on liftoff, came down and hit the leading edge of the shuttle, which then incinerated on, on reentry. They didn't anticipate all the problems. They thought they had them all fixed after Challenger, but didn't anticipate them all effectively after Columbia. The Hubble Space Telescope, another highly engineered, billions of dollars, the smartest minds in the business, 
constructed the mirror on the Hubble precisely to the slightly wrong measurement. And it was put into space, and they got fuzzy images, and they realized, oops. So the fact that the, the bottom line here is, and this is the last slide of, this, of this, my morning presentation, in Fukushima, of course, they had redundant backup systems in, in Japan for the 2011 tsunami and earthquake. The reactors shut down automatically as they were designed to do, but what they hadn't anticipated was flooding of the auxiliary uh, generator areas, which were then to run the pumps to cool the reactor cores. So while the reactors shut down as planned, the pumps couldn't cool the reactors, and they had three uh, meltdowns, reactor core meltdowns, and a hydrogen air explosion. So just another way of saying stuff happens. And as smart as we think we are, we need to be a little more humble and a little more honest and a little more authentic amongst all of ourselves, between government, industry, and the public, that things can go wrong. When they do go wrong, they go wrong in a ma major catastrophic way. We need to do better about preventing them. I'll leave it at that right now, but I just wanted to put that up to show you that here's my home in Alaska. And uh, so we're just, I'm just kind of over the, over the pole from you, just a next door neighbor. So, okay, thank you very much. And I'll see you this afternoon.